think it's well worth doing. For your encouragement. New light through all windows, they say. Mm. No, that's what the old saying is. New light through all windows. Is that right? Mm. Nobody's ever heard of that, no? Mm. Say it again, Alan. New light through old windows. It's like. Uh, no, you see something wine. fresh. Yeah. 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 New light. <laughs> <laughs> I thought everybody knew that one. Okay, well, look. Um, We'll go to Matthew 16, and that's staying here. I'm just going to bounce off this to where I need to get to. But we were looking at these, as, uh, as I said, it is foundational. A foundation is when you start a building, you put in a foundation. Isn't that right? So we need to understand that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is unique. Hallelujah. Amen. Very, very unique and different in every way. It's not just another religion or another, it's not even another option. <laughs> It's not like you have right religion and wrong religion. It's like it's totally unique. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're getting into it. And as we speak to the things that are truth in the word, we seem to, re seem to understand a little bit more, you know, what a Christian is. And, you know, a Christian is just a term that people use to refer to followers of Jesus, disciples. But when you fully break it down, that Christian, there's a lot to that Christian. There's a lot to that disciple. They are a new creature in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. They are a new creation. They are washed in the blood of Jesus. They have righteousness status before the throne of God, which is absolutely wonderful. And the Bible even calls us sons of God. A lot of people will fall over and choke even at that. But that's what the Bible says. And why are we called the sons of God? Because God birthed you in Christ Jesus. The Bible says you're birthed from above, born of the Spirit. Hallelujah. In a similar way, you know, and I'm being very careful here and reverent when I say this, but, you know, the Holy Spirit overshadowed the womb of Mary and the Son of God was birthed by the Father in her womb. So we understand that, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a level, I suppose. Yeah. And you see, when we became Christians, when we followed Jesus, what actually happened was a very spiritual event took place where the Holy Spirit... Uh, give birth to your spirit all over again and you became either born again which is true or born of the spirit or born from above all those those descriptions are correct okay so you're totally changed hallelujah and then you have the holy spirit living on the inside of you so the bible says that you are a new creature all things have passed away all things have become new all things are of god you're now in fellowship with God. You have his nature on the inside of you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful when you see a little child growing up and the wee child, all it wants to do is be like daddy or be like mommy because it's their nature to mimic the parent. Hallelujah. And God gives you that same nature on the inside. Praise God. And nevertheless, that may raise questions among people. You know, why do people do bad things when they become Christians? Well, we need our minds renewed. Hallelujah, we need to get into the Word, we need to get into prayer, we need to shake off all the old dust from off us and begin to shine the light that God has put on the inside of us. Praise God. Isn't that the way things, we need to see it that way? But you still are a new creation. A lot of people may be behaving badly, not in this church of course, but people out there could be believers, could be born again, could be behaving badly, but they will change. Holy Spirit. Jesus is their Lord. He is their Savior. He is their Shepherd and he will take issue with his children. <laughs> and how do you know that? Because he took issue with me. Yeah. And I know because I'm his child. He doesn't let me away with things that I, you know, that I should know better for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, he's probably Amen. very merciful. Yeah. And anything he does is for your good. That's right. You know, even if he brings us to a place where we need to bow the knee, it's still for our good, to bring, give us a better end. Amen? Amen? So the Bible says in the book of he Hebrews, the despise not the chastening of the Lord. Hallelujah. So we're brushing across a lot of topics there, but I'm just bringing them all together so that we can see that, that you are different. Amen? You're a stranger. You're a pilgrim. You're a child of God. You're righteousness. You're the light in the darkness, <laughs> salt of the earth. Hallelujah. Because the Holy Spirit has birthed at you in the inside. 
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So these are all foundational truths. These are things, we talked about some of these things last week. We talked about the new birth, just to give ourselves a better understanding of it. It is an event. It is a changing event. It's not a fixer-upper. It's not a refurbishment. You know when you go to a, a house, an old house, and it's all broken down, there's issues, there's dampness and stuff, and you refurbish the house. You know, builders and plasters come in and, you know, they don't tear down the full house, but they save what they can and they put on new plaster and put a bit of new wiring in and a new ceiling and the house is refurbished. It's fixed up. Not the case. The Lord comes in with a bulldozer and flattens the house, puts in a brand new foundation and builds brand new walls, brand new ceilings, brand new windows, doors, everything. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Because why? Because everything off this earth is weak and sinful and bears the traits of the first Adam. Amen. Which got its traits from the devil in true rebellion. And God has made all things new. So all things are of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. It's reason to rejoice this morning. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All these things are true. Yeah. Jesus would say, verily, verily, yes. truly, truly, That's these it. things are true. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. So don't regard your feelings this morning as the great indicators of the kingdom of God because they're a poor indicator of the kingdom of God. Your feelings are for this world. Yeah. Your feelings are for your body. Your feelings <laughs> are to navigate you in this life, in this world. And your feelings needs to be trained to live in the word of God, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And if you get an odd goosebump, enjoy it, but it doesn't mean it's not the end all. Amen? Some of the greatest answers to prayer I ever got was when I never even felt God present. Hallelujah. And God answered the prayer. And there's been other times where I could hardly walk, as the man says, I was drunk in the spirit, falling over. And then I prayed for things and nothing happened. You know, and I can't reconcile the two together, but nevertheless, it's not an indicator. It's not an indicator. Praise God. So we trust in the Word, because the Word of God is perfect, the Word of God is true. Now, I spent five minutes there just bringing us up. Is that okay? So Jesus mentioned this church in Matthew 16, and we're going to bounce on this and then move on. <coughs> so Jesus said this to uh, Simon Peter, who do you say that I am? And the other disciples and Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, so this was a massive uh, statement that Simon Peter said. Christ immediately put the spotlight on that and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So Peter, what you have just said has come from God, has come from heaven. And then Jesus said in verse 18, And I say unto you, I say also unto you, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Jesus put in a nutshell there, in a very small capsule, you know, um, a picture, a picture of the church. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So that's like a vision that's looking forward from that moment all the way to the end of the world. Isn't that it? Because I believe that Jesus will be still building the church even when the Antichrist is on the earth. There will be people getting saved. Yeah, that's the yeah, future. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And even now and past. So Christ is busy, busy, busy. His church is busy, busy, busy. So the Lord gave us in a quick snapshot of his church right here in this scripture. But he did say then, he says, I will also give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There, it's an awesome scripture, praise God. And uh, I think just maybe to understand it a little bit, little, little bit more, I just want to give us two scriptures and now I want to move on. Because in order for Christ to build his church, in order for the saints to be moving around, you know, binding and loosing and having success and bringing witness to the kingdom of God, lots of things have to happen. Isn't that true? You know, lots of things. People have to be born again. People have to be moving in faith. God to be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's working with us and... Uh, the revelation of God is, you know, being manifest and things are happening in order for changes to happen. Changes and changes to happen all over the place. But there's two scriptures I looked at here. and One is in Isaiah 22, 22. 
And it kind of gives a little bit of a foundation where we're coming from in terms of keys. <coughs> if we could just take that one scripture, I'm not teaching on it, I just want to reference it. In Isaiah 22, 22, it's actually, um, I need to find it myself yeah. now because I want to give you, it's what's known as a type of Christ. Uh, so this is spoken over uh, a servant of the Lord called uh, Elakim, the son of Hilkiah. And it says, I will clothe thee with a robe in verse 21 and strengthen him with a girdle and I will commit thy government in his hand and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David shall I lay upon his shoulder so he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open. Yes. Praise God. Now, what, you know, that's obviously a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen? But what I like about that is it says, when he opens, none shuts. And when he shuts, none will open. So it's like his key is the authority, the final authority. Nobody messes with that key. That's Nobody true. has the power to mess with yeah. that key. Praise God. So I'm starting to get a little bit more excited when Jesus said he's going to give unto us the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Because if you've got keys that nobody is going to mess with, you've got authority. Now, can we go to the book of he Re Revelation? And this is in Revelation 3, 7. And this is to the, remember the letter to the church of Philadelphia? Because nowadays, you know, when you reference keys, it doesn't seem to have the same, I would just say, meaning about it. Because you see, you know, Anne could have the key of her home, but she might could sneak off and get a key cut to that house. <laughs> so we could both have keys of the house. Isn't that right? Could you take up my key? I could probably end up in jail, and I know that. <laughs> for doing that. But, I forgive you. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, but if you have a key that none can open, if once Anne opens that, nobody can shut it. All the king's horses, all the king's men can try to shut a door that Anne opens, and they're all lost because they can't shut this door. They're not able to close it. Or if she closes the door, nobody can open it. Imagine having that key because you just have the one key. Praise the Lord. Okay? So this is the key the Lord is talking about here, and it's the key of David, the throne of David. What do we say? It's in um, Revelation 3 and verse 7. It says, The angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. Okay, same reference. Yeah. And you do know that it was King David that was given that great prophecy by Nathan that it would be from his seed. There will be an everlasting throne right. yeah. set up. Okay, so this was referring to Jesus, and Jesus is the seed of David. Yeah. Okay, so the key of David concerning that same kingdom is given to who? Jesus. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Now, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and what's the next words? And no man shut, shut it. And he that shut it, no man openeth. So this key has absolute authority, and it's a once-off. Nobody can mess with this key. Okay. Praise God. Okay, so I just want to show you the power of this key. Jesus has this key, and then he turns to his disciples in Matthew 16 and says, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of God. Amen. So um, <clears throat> I know that, as we mentioned earlier on in the message here, that there's so many things is built upon that. Upon the keys of the kingdom of God so many things happen we want to understand them but the key things one of the key things we talked about is the new creature in Christ Jesus being born of the spirit born from above the next thing I want to talk about this morning maybe for 10 or 15 minutes through the scriptures here is the baptism in the Holy Spirit is an absolute essential teaching for the body of Christ what did Jesus talk about in John's gospel the whole way from John 13 14, 15, 16, and then into 17, where he prayed to his Father. Yeah. He talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that correct? Yeah. The Comforter, the Spirit of Truth. He will reveal to you all things. He will reveal things of me to you. So 
Jesus talked about to his disciples there would be another baptism, there would be a comforter would come in his name. Praise God. I will not leave you orphanless, but I will come to you. Isn't that what he said? It's expedient for you that I go away. So I want to look at this uh, in Acts of the Apostles this morning. Pastor Gordon will be so sad he's not here. He's going to get so excited yes. in the chair right now. <laughs> and I want to show you, you know, the promise of Jesus in Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 1. And then I want to look at four different places in, in the Acts of the Apostles where it talked about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And there's learning, there's teaching, there's learning in it all. And, you know, I think you say, well, you know, I had some very, very, um, ex some experiences myself, which I'd like to share with you regarding baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because I was one of these people that got saved, got born again, and was not baptized in the Holy Spirit for several months. And got to the point where I was getting frustrated and discouraged. And if anybody was talking to me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I began to shut them out. Because they were a pain in the neck at this point. They were just <laughs> amplifying my disappointment. You know. So, I wonder if I can, I want to show it to you this morning. It's in the scriptures. It is a blessing. It is essential. And I can show you exactly how to receive it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Awful easy. Amen. I can take misconceptions out of the way because I was, you know, clouded with misconceptions. I always thought if the Holy Spirit was here, the foundation of the building would be shaken right now. <laughs> you know, and Christians all, like when I was a young Christian, it doesn't happen as much now, it is, especially not in this church. You know, these flaky, kind of nutty, fruit and nut type. Okay, all the way down. Lovable brothers in the Lord and sisters in the Lord. <laughs> and they put on these shows for you. <laughs> you know, and they're at this carry on. And you're measuring yourself, going, I don't have that. You know, do you want that? No. You know. Because, <laughs> you know, if I'm not in, in full control of my spirit, that's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's influencing my spirit. And I will bring out of that nothing but the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing but the nature of joy, holiness, and peace, and help. Also, there may be authority toward the enemy if that's needed, but that's fine. But I never heard Jesus screaming at a devil. He only just spoke to them and said, be quiet. Peace, peace. Hold your peace. You know, he had absolute authority. Isn't that correct? So all that, you know... What would Pastor Gordon Corbett call it? I don't know. He'd have some name for it anyways. <laughs> sham. He'd call it sham. The gospel is sham. All right, so let's get into the word because time isn't. So look at the promise of Jesus. And I want to emphasize here, starting out, the, um, that Jesus really did say that this is the next step in the gospel. as he. So the former, uh, Acts, Acts 1, verse 1, the former treaties... Have I made, O Theophilus, of Jesus, all that Jesus began to both do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion mm -hmm. by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Praise God. So Jesus spoke about these things. They were in the scriptures, they were in the gospels, and they were right in the Old Testament as well. Hallelujah. Example, John 7, 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture had said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Yeah. Okay, so Jesus says, as the scripture has said. So he was quoting what? The Old Testament. Isn't that right? Yeah. Okay, so there's no direct translation of that, but there's many scriptures in there. One of my favorite ones would be Proverbs 4, verse 23, and I quote it quite a lot in this church. It says, keep your heart or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of mm -hmm. it are the, the issues, issues of life. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. now Jesus, you know, Isaiah 55 1 talks about come to the water and all that sort of stuff. But Jesus says, as the scriptures have said, out of your belly shall 
flow rivers of living water. So he's referencing these scriptures. Okay, so Jesus had spoke about these things. He had spoke to his disciples and he had said, this is the, wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard of me. For John, um, and John did say this in Luke 3.16, but we won't turn to it. Is that okay for time's sake? John truly baptized with water, but he shall be, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Okay? You remember John's reference? Is everybody familiar with John's reference? He answered and he said unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I come is yeah. the latch of the whose shoes I'm already going on loose. He said, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So one of the great ministries, essential ministries of the New Testament believer is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Don't panic just yet. As I said, it's not about all quaking buildings and fire coming down from heaven and people <coughs> looking like they're having some sort of a medical problem, a fit of some sort, you know. It could be the Holy Spirit. You know, there's the old holy rollers and stuff like that. Do you remember those? They used to roll up and down and you know, there's anyways, I don't want to knock any experience that you may have had in the past and now you've fallen out with me over that, but I'm just saying that, you know, if you're not in control of yourself that can be a problem <laughs> okay so then jesus said in verse six and we we'll skip on from here it says and therefore uh, were come together and uh, they asked of him sorry when they were come together they asked of him saying lord wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of israel and he said unto them it's not for you to know the times of the season which the father had put in his own power but you shall receive power okay that's the word, Greek word dunamis. We get the word dynamite from, okay? Yeah. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Praise God. So Jesus again redirected their attention and says, You will be what? Witnesses unto me. You shall receive power. Power. Now we recap this at the very end to show you why the Lord baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. And one is to be a witness. Mm -hmm. So what is a witness? It's a person that gives evidence. So we need to be like really leaking information that Jesus has given to us. You have to be shown the signs that you're a supernatural born again creature in Christ Jesus. Isn't that it? That, that makes you a witness. And then he says... You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost coming on you. Witnesses, and then he says in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and then in Samaria, and then unto the uttermost parts of the world. So this Holy Ghost experience, some will argue, it's only for the apostles and the early church. Jesus did not say that. Where did he say it was going to go? To the uttermost parts of the earth. Yeah. Uttermost. Actually, it says part of the earth. Did you see that? little language thing but I think I thought I'd like to be amused by that praise the Lord uttermost part of the earth and I actually looked it up now this is how silly my mind is okay what would be the furthest part from where Jesus was speaking right now where was he speaking speaking in Jerusalem yeah. isn't that right where would be the furthest part of the earth from Jerusalem it's actually in New Zealand did you know that <laughs> you follow my thinking here so it would the Lord is making a statement he says the furthest most part of the earth now he was only saying but I just thought it would be fun to look it up right? a place called Taragang Taraganga is the name of the city it's in New, New Zealand and it's 16,415 kilometers away from where Jesus was saying that praise the Lord Amen. what did I do next I googled the city and guess what? There's churches there. <laughs> there's cults there as well. But there's churches there. Christian churches. Ones that are called abundant life and all these different things. And I thought, praise the Lord. The Lord has fulfilled his prophecy. The gospel has gone out to the furthest part of the earth. From where he's speaking. Isn't that wonderful? I used to always think of Africa. And I think of places. Africa's not too far from Jerusalem. You know that? No. But the furthest part is New Zealand. <laughs> Anyways. I must look that up. Do look it up. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> You'd call that trivia. Isn't that what that is? It's a bit of information. Not much use. It's a bit of information. It is. <laughs> okay. Some of you was in New Zealand. But no, it wasn't. Um, Louise was in Australia. 
All right. Praise God. Something I do, something I've done there, do a bike trip or something like that. So let's go on. Um, because time is, we're going to just have to really zoom on. So first thing we want to look at is the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we go through four outpourings. Is that okay? So the first one was the initial one. This comes from the promise. It's in Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and filled the house where they were sitting. So it came with you know, tangible evidence. Isn't that right? It, it came, this one did come with the rooms shaking in the house. And it was like a mighty wind. And nobody knew what was happening because this was the first off. There was no precedent. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Ghost. There it is. That's what we were waiting for. The Holy Ghost has arrived. He's in the building. And the people were all, and what happened all that? Look at the next words. They began to speak with other tongues. Wow. Okay, so this is new. This has never happened before. So when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, the first thing that happens is you speak with other tongues. Now, on this occasion, that is true. But also in other occasions, as we look through the, the next different stages to the Acts of the Apostles, this also happens all the time. Praise God. So it would be safe to conclude <coughs> that speaking in tongues is evidence <coughs> of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now don't panic about that. Don't panic about that because I got filled with the Holy Spirit and didn't speak with tongues for a little while afterwards. And then I did speak with tongues and boy, my life changed. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Praise God. <coughs> James, would you put that troublemaker out of the church, please? Good to see them, ladies. Praise the Lord. You're very welcome. That's some welcome, Karen. <laughs> Trying to put her out of the church. As Carrie would say, you'd have to come home with me in the car. Okay. All right. We're, we're <laughs> so, um, as I said, this is the first outpouring. It's in Acts 2. Um, I want to go to the second outpouring then, which is in Acts 8. Mm -hmm. So this is where Philip went down to Samaria. We're fast forwarding through these. So a lot of you that are familiar with Acts would know what's actually happening in terms of the events. Okay, and one of the events was that there was a persecution in the church. You remember that? Um, Ananias and Sapphira had sinned and then the persecution broke out and then they Apostles stayed at Jerusalem, but the rest of the church ran. They, they literally packed their bags overnight and ran. And they went down to Philip, the Bible says, went down to Samaria. Now, I didn't do any trivia looking up on that. I leave that up to you where Samaria is, but it's, it's not really important. But this is the first outpouring outside of Jerusalem of the Holy Spirit. And let's see what we can learn of this. This is in Acts 8 and 15. It says... Who, when they were come down, sorry, oh, I skipped ahead there. So, verse 14, let's go to verse 14. It says, When the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Okay? Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's something that we can learn straight away about the Holy Spirit is that these people have been converted to Jesus. They had accepted the gospel, they accepted the word, but they hadn't had the Holy Spirit. So, you know, you have to beg the question then, if Philip never went down to Samaria and Peter and John never heard about this, could they have sat forever in a room and never had the Holy Spirit still be saved? And I believe the answer will be yes. Mm -hmm. You know, they would have been left without this promise of God. So um, you've heard this preach many times, I'm sure, but it is two separate experiences. Being born again is one. Become yeah. a new creature is very real. It's a very, very you know, um, clear event that happens to a person becomes a new creature. And the second event is they receive the Holy Spirit on top of them. So we can see that from the Word of God here. Right. So this is the second time. This happened outside Jerusalem. So first time is in Jerusalem. Don't worry, we're getting to New Zealand now. <laughs> so the first time is in Jerusalem. The second time is outside of Jerusalem in Samaria. And um, it says, what did they do? In verse 17, it says, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. 
So that's a different way, isn't it, of receiving the Holy Spirit. The first time the Holy Spirit just fell on them, and the second time they laid hands on them. But they had to tell them about the Holy Spirit. Okay? Do you see that? Yeah. So they're um, not being disclined to them or anything like that, but they were a little bit clueless. They didn't know that there was a Holy Spirit. Isn't that true? Yeah. Okay, so that's that church. That's outside Jerusalem. Let's go to Acts 10 then. And this is actually very important to us, guys. So Acts 10 and verse 44, because these were the first Gentiles. And that's what we are. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right, so you're in that group. Lots of Christians trying to become Jews today. I don't know why that is, but as well. We won't go down that road. There's no need to, really, because Jesus has done everything for you already. It's not going to leave you shy of anything. All right, we leave that alone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where were we? We were in Acts 11, no, 10, verse 44. So this is the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. And uh, our buddy and founder of the Gentile church is Cornelius. Remember him? Yeah. He was a Roman, Roman centurion. Yeah. Big vision. Peter got a big vision. He was told to go to Cornelius' house. Cornelius already had the house packed full of people. When he arrived, everybody gets saved. Great night. Praise the Lord. So, and then verse... Um, on verse 44, after Peter was preaching the gospel, or while he was preaching to all these people... Verse 44 says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they were they of the circumcision, of course, obviously there must have been Jews there as well, they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay? And what's verse 46 say? For they heard them speak with tongues. tongues. So again, the evidence of tongues is there. For a second time in, they're still speaking with tongues. All right. And then he says, um, and they magnified God. And Peter answered, can any man forbid water that these should be baptized? So here's something that you, you need to be understanding as well. These people were saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and not baptized with water. Okay. So that that is... A very important thing to know because some people attribute the actual act of water baptism for necessity a necessity for salvation if you're not water baptized you can't be saved okay not in this church but it's actually outside this church you'll hear that being said water baptism is an outward sign it's a demonstration it's a testimony and it's a witness and I think it's a right and proper thing to do but it doesn't affect your salvation between you and Jesus Christ. Yeah. I could show you what the place is in the scripture, but I just want to show you that as we're passing. I'm pointing at it as I'm passing in the car. Okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Am I hurting anybody's doctrine there? So these guys got saved, they got baptized in the Holy Ghost, and then Peter says, Break out the water, let's baptize them in water. Three things. Yeah. And they speak with tongues. Now, the last one I want to get to is in uh, Acts 19.1. This is the last outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's accounted for, you know, in the scriptures. Now, this was a church that Paul came across in Ephesus. Um, and let's read down through a few scriptures here in uh, chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass while Apollos um, was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Okay, so he found these disciples that were having a house meeting in Balmalak. Mm. Right? <laughs> Friends of, <laughs> of Catherine's. <laughs> I'm only joking. But that's the kind of scenario. They were passing by these people. He said unto them, this is Paul, walks in the door, put the kettle on, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So what was, what was pretty much top of Paul's agenda? He was buzzing about this, wasn't he? You know? And listen to what they say. They said unto him, we have not so much heard that there are, there are any Holy Ghosts. So they knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. Again, 
to use our little word this morning, clueless. They were clueless. They were, and the Bible says in verse 19, sorry, chapter one, uh, chapter 19, verse 1, that they were disciples. They were disciples, okay? But they didn't know there was a Holy Ghost. And he said to them, well, well uh, what baptism were you, um, were you baptized with? And they said, well, John's baptism, you know? So they were basically oh, yeah. repented, came to Christ yeah. through John's baptism, but didn't know Christ yeah. really, all right? And then Paul said, no, verily John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Now, there's a bit in this sense, if you had more time, it would be good fun to really dig into this now. Because there's a bit of this goes on in Christianity and a bit of this goes on in church. Baptism of repentance, okay? Yeah, it's part of your conversion that you, you have to do a turnabout. But it's not the be all and end all. It's not, it doesn't absolutely define <coughs> what we do in our understanding of the gospel. I really get love more time to preach on this. So John preached a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is Jesus Christ. So the true gospel is believe on Jesus Christ. Repentance is just something you do to do that. Pause, Sila. <laughs> I was in Donegal one time. It was one of my first big, sort of big um, chances to preach to a crowd. And I was at the opening of this church down in... Um, it was actually the, the time before we went to France the first time when the kids were small. And the night before, I was down in Kelly Beggs. And I got up and I had a message which I preached in here, which really kind of was good. And it was about the, the seven times Jesus shed blood at Calvary. Mm -hmm. So I knew this message and I went down and preached that message. And I was pleased with myself that I got it across. And a good few people come up to me and says, Praise the Lord, that was a lovely message. I never heard that before. And one fella came up to me. Now, the fact that he had a very staunch North of North Ireland accent, he said to me, You never mentioned repentance once. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I wasn't preaching on repentance, I was preaching on the blood of Jesus. And he got crosser with me when I said that. <laughs> Anyways, it didn't end up in a nice place. I ended up telling him, I said, Tell you what, you can preach next time. I said, I, I listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That was the best I could muster up in kindness and at the time. So, anyways, uh, these this is where these were. But let's get down where we need to get get into where we need to get to. Um, uh, John preached the baptism of repentance. He says he said that you should believe on the one coming after, which is Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, here's another thing that people get a bit hung up on and I know some people personally who get hung up on that one thing there because it says in Luke's gospel and Jesus was preaching to the disciples to go ye out into all the world preach the gospel to every creature baptizing him in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit that was a command that was given to the church to the end of time this statement that was recorded here by Luke in Acts is just making a reference to John's baptism and Jesus's baptism. That's all it's doing. It's not redefining baptism as you now only need to be baptized in the name of the Lord. You follow what I'm saying? Take it in context, in the context of the scripture. He's talking about John's baptism and then he's talking about Jesus' baptism. That's all. So what is Jesus' baptism? The Holy Spirit. To be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the kingdom of God. You know, there's many baptisms, as we know. Yeah. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. But if they, some people take that scripture on its own, out of context, and start to preach that now the church needs to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ only. Wrong. No, that's not right. Praise God. And it does matter. You know, if you think, well, that, that's only, it does matter that. Praise the Lord. It's kind of nullifying things that Christ has said. Anyway, we move on. We're fairly smacking down things here this morning, aren't we? Yeah. I'm nearly finished. Give me two more minutes. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6, and when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost come on them. And what happened next? They speak with tongues and prophesy. Again, the Bible takes time to emphasize that the evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is speaking with tongues and prophesying. All four... <clears throat> all four instances where we read the first one was in Jerusalem second one was outside Jerusalem in Samaria third one was with the Gentile church in Cornelius house and then the last one was with this random church that he found in Balnalak 
<laughs> they were all disciples, but they had been caught in an old tradition of some sort, John's baptism. And Paul says, hang on. And he laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So how long was it before they got <coughs> baptized in the Holy Spirit from when they got saved first? We don't know. Quite a while. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, look at, sorry, time has gone on. I, I told you that I was going to give you a little bit. If you can give me two more minutes, is that okay? And then I, if you need to go, fine. Um, if you give me two minutes. My own experience regarding this was I, when I got saved, and I can't go through all that, um, and came to Jesus, um, I, first of all, went to a Baptist church, okay, which was a brilliant church. It was an awesome church. And then I, I met Pastor Gordon and a few, and Michal and a few of the guys who was going to bring me down to this Pentecostal church, right? Now, I was all for that. I thought, this is awesome. When I got down to the Pentecostal church, it was a little bit like a three-ring circus. The lads were all going on. And, anyways, they were trying to get me baptized in the Holy Spirit. This wasn't happening because I needed to know a few things in my mind. One thing we need to, need to realize, and I, <clears throat> one of the things that's worthy of saying is every time that Paul introduced the Holy Spirit to a new set of believers that didn't prior to this know that there was a Holy Spirit, he taught them on it. He spoke about, about the Holy Spirit. He told them something about the Holy Spirit. So it requires faith through hearing the word. Very important. Amen? Amen. Jesus spoke about it, brought faith. I'm running out of time and I'm so sad about this because I really wish I had more time to talk about it. To get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to understand the scriptures yeah. regarding it so that you can put faith in yeah. it. Yeah. Second thing is, remember this, when you were born again, I don't know what circumstances you were born again in, but when I gave my life to Jesus, I felt nothing. Remember again, emotions are for you. This life are not particularly a key indicator to the spiritual world. So I didn't feel anything when I got born again. I felt nothing. So this massive change took place on the inside of me and my feelings didn't even pick up on it one time. Who said that you had to be feeling anything being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Nobody. It's not in the scriptures. So you need to put faith in the scriptures and receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit the same way as you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, based on the word and not on buzzy, buzzy feelings. Because that's what people make mistakes because they're standing there, somebody <coughs> laying hands on them, and then they feel that I'm not going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I don't feel adrenaline, I don't feel a heat rush, I don't feel a cold rush, I don't feel goosebumps, mm -hmm. therefore the Holy Spirit is not going to be, I'll wait a bit longer, I'll wait a bit longer. Maybe if I tense myself up, I'll feel the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, still not happening. What happens after that? Disappointment. You go back to your seat, you're disappointed. You're thinking now God doesn't love you anymore because he gave it to him but not to you. Not to you. It's not what starts to happen. You're on a roller coaster. That was nothing to do with what was happening there. You, the moment you asked the Lord to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you received it. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 You know, I didn't speak with tongues after I felt so. There was a time I got to that point. I, I'd love to spend more time to go through it, but I got to that point. I was in prayer lines. The lads had me in prayer lines. This is your night, brother. This is your night, you know. And as one man said, there was fellas there going, hold on, Alan, hold on, Alan. And then there was fellas behind me laying hands on me going, let go, brother, let go, brother. <laughs> hold on, let go. Uh, and they were at me all sides. I went to Castle Bar for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I went everywhere. And every preacher in every town, in every mission, laid hands on me for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was not in faith. I was looking for goosebumps. Okay, when I got into faith concerning the word, I received it. How did you know you received it? I believed the word. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I didn't speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how I thought it. I thought that the Holy Spirit would take over my voice box and I wouldn't be able to stop him from, you know, Isha Radaba. 
you're not trying to stop the Holy Spirit. You know, you speak with tongues. You give your tongues to the Lord. He will speak it, right? <laughs> but I wasn't trusting. I thought it's either me. This could either, either be me or it could be the Lord. I can speak with tongues. I can copy other people. I can speak with tongues. It's easy. Isn't that right? So I went. And just in closing, I, I could maybe do a little bit more on this before we take off on our next subject in the next time. But I asked a brother one time, I says, why should I speak with tongues? And he says, well, what does the Bible say about speaking in tongues? And then he told me, he said, in June 20, it says, Beloved, you build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So speaking in tongues is for building yourself up. Yeah. Isn't that it? Yes. Then he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 4, it says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies him self. self. Isn't that right? But he that prophesies edifies the church. Yeah. And then it also says in more teaching, but we'll have to skip really fast through it. In 1 Corinthians 14, um, 14 and 15, it says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, and my understanding is unfruitful. So if you're speaking in tongues, don't expect to understand it. Now, I will spend more time at this, I think, because I think it needs it. Because sometimes people think that tongues is like a comparable language, that there's syllables, that there's... Uh, vowels and verbs and there's uh, nouns and adjectives and it's all made up into a sentence. No, no, it's nothing to do with that. These are sounds that cannot be uttered. Mm -hmm. Praise God. The communication is going from spirit to spirit. Yeah. You're just making an audible grunt. You're like a machine squeaking. <laughs> That's what you're doing. All right. So, um, Paul says he prays in the spirit, he prays and the understanding is unfruitful. He says, what then? He says, I will pray in the spirit, I will pray with the understanding, I will sing in the spirit, and I will also sing in the understanding. So yes. you can sing in tongues, yes, you can pray in yeah. tongues, and Paul talks about giving advice, but nobody's going to know what you're saying. Okay, for that reason, we, we kind of put a cap on it in the church a little bit, because, you know, there's no point in me going to... to um, um, Linda down there going, you know something, Linda, she or that, 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 blah, 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 you know, because Linda will probably go, Alan, that's not English, you know, I can't understand what you're saying. And Paul says, you know, be mindful of that yeah. in the church, your usage. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Praise God. So, anyways, back to what I'm saying, and I really have a I'm breaking all records, and I'm asking you not to tell Pastor Carol that I preached this long. <laughs> but, um, I asked the brother, why should I speak in tongues? He says, you need to build yourself up. So I went off and I says, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to my bedroom. I'm going to speak in tongues for 20 minutes. If I'm not edified, I say, that's it, over. Not doing it anymore. Okay? So I went to home in the bedroom. Guess what happened? Five minutes in, ten minutes in, I was absolutely in third heaven, praising the Lord, speaking mm -hmm. in tongues. So the scripture came alive. That's it. it absolutely was the real thing. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Amen. Is that okay? Amen. Okay, look, I'll have to leave it at that. I always want to kind of make everything kind of signed and sealed. And... Well, praise the Lord. Let's pray. We'll leave it at that. Father, thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that the, the portion we received this morning, Father, I know it's only portion, that it will make um, sense and it will be a help to all that ever hears this. I pray, Father, it will strengthen those and encourage those, Lord, that may be saved and haven't yet received the Holy Ghost. And I know, Lord, that is quite the truth across the church. So I pray, Lord, that people will have faith to reach out in the Word and just receive all that the Lord has for them in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, saints. Thank you, Alan.